Chapter twenty four of the Return of Dr. Fu Manchu. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elaine Tweddle. The Return of Dr. Fu Manchu by Sax Romer. Chapter twenty four. Story of the Gables. In looking over my notes dealing with the second phase of Dr. Fu Manchu's activities in England, I find that one of the worst hours of my life was associated with the singular and seemingly inconsequent adventure of the fiery hand. I shall deal with it in this place, begging you to bear with me if I seem to digress. Inspector Weymouth called one morning shortly after the Van Roon episode, and entered upon a surprising account of a visit to a house at Hampstead, which enjoyed the sinister reputation of being uninhabitable. "'But in what way does the case enter into your province?' inquired Nayland Smith, idly tapping out his pipe on a bar of the grate. We had not long finished breakfast, but from an early hour Smith had been at his eternal smoking, which only the advent of the meal had interrupted. "'Well,' replied the inspector, who occupied a big armchair near the window, "'I was sent to look into it, I suppose, because I had nothing better to do at the moment.' "'Ah!' jerked Smith, glancing over his shoulder. The ejaculation had a veiled significance, for our quest of Dr. Fu Manchu had come to an abrupt termination by reason of the fact that all trace of that malignant genius and of the group surrounding him had vanished with the destruction of Craigmire Tower. "'The house is called the Gables,' continued the Scotland Yard man, "'and I knew I was on a wild goose chase from the first. "'Why?' snapped Smith. "'Because I was there before, six months ago or so, just before your present return to England, and I knew what to expect.' Smith looked up with some faint dawning of interest perceptible in his manner. "'I was unaware,' he said with a slight smile, "'that the cleaning up of haunted houses came within the jurisdiction of Scotland Yard. I am learning something.' "'In the ordinary way,' replied the big man good-humouredly, "'it doesn't, but a sudden death always excites suspicion, and—' "'A sudden death?' I said, glancing up. "'You didn't explain that the ghost had killed anyone.' "'I'm afraid I'm a poor hand at yarn-spinning, doctor,' said Weymouth, turning his blue, twinkling eyes in my direction. Two people have died at the Gables within the last six months.' "'You begin to interest me,' declared Smith, and there came something of the old, eager look into his gaunt face, as having lighted his pipe he tossed the match-end into the hearth. "'I had hoped for some little excitement myself,' confessed the inspector. "'This dead end, with not a ghost of a clue to the whereabouts of the yellow fiend, has been getting on my nerves.' Nayland Smith grunted sympathetically. "'Although Dr. Fu Manchu has been in England for some months now,' continued Weymouth, "'I have never set eyes upon him. The house we raided in Museum Street proved to be empty. In a word, I am wasting my time.' so that I volunteered to run up to Hampstead to look into the matter of the Gables, principally as a distraction. It's a queer business, but more in the Psychical Research Society's line than mine, I'm afraid. Still, if there were no Dr. Fu Manchu, it might be of interest to you, and to you, Dr. Petrie, because it illustrates the fact that, given the right sort of subject, death can be brought about without any elaborate mechanism, such as our Chinese friends employ. "'You interest me more and more,' declared Smith, stretching himself in the long white cane rest-chair. Two men, both fairly sound, except that the first one had an asthmatic heart, have died at the gables without anyone laying a finger upon them. Oh, there was no jugglery. They weren't poisoned, or bitten by venomous insects, or suffocated, or anything like that. They just died of fear. Stark fear.' With my elbows resting upon the table cover and my chin in my hands, I was listening attentively now, and Nayland Smith, a big cushion behind his head, was watching the speaker with a keen and speculative look in those steely eyes of his. "'You imply that Dr. Fu Manchu has something to learn from the Gables?' he jerked. Weymouth nodded stolidly. "'I can't work up anything like amazement in these days,' continued the latter. "'Every other case seems stale and hackneyed alongside the case.' But I must confess that when the gables came on the books of the yard the second time, I began to wonder. I thought there might be some tangible clue, some link connecting the two victims, perhaps some evidence of robbery or of revenge or some sort of motive. In short, I hoped to find evidence of human agency at work, but, as before, I was disappointed. "'It's a legitimate case of a haunted house, then,' said Smith. "'Yes, we find them occasionally, these uninhabitable places, where there is something, something malignant and harmful to human life, but something that you cannot arrest, that you cannot hope to bring into court.' 
ah replied smith slowly i suppose you are right there are historic instances of course glamis castle and spedlin's tower in scotland peel castle isle of man with its maud du the grey lady of raynham hall the headless horses of caister the wesley ghost of epworth rectory and others but i have never come in personal contact with such a case and if i did i should feel very humiliated to have to confess that there was an agency which could produce a physical result death but which was immune from physical retaliation weymouth nodded his head again i might feel a bit sour about it too he replied if it were not that i haven't much pride left in these days considering the show of physical retaliation i have made against dr fu manchu a home thrust weymouth snapped nayland smith with one of those rare boyish laughs of his we're children to that chinese doctor inspector to that weird product of a weird people who are as old in evil as the pyramids are old in mystery but what about the gables well it's an uncanny place you have mentioned glamis castle a moment ago and it's possible to understand an old stronghold like that being haunted but the gables was only built about eighteen seventy it's quite a modern house it was built for a wealthy quaker family and they occupied it uninterruptedly and apparently without anything unusual occurring for over forty years then it was sold to a mr madison and mr madison died there six months ago madison said smith sharply staring across at weymouth what was he where did he come from he was a retired tea planter from colombo replied the inspector colombo there was a link with the east certainly if that's what you are thinking and it was this fact which interested me at the time and which led me to waste precious days and nights on the case that there was no mortal connection between this liverish individual and the schemes of dr fu manchu i'm certain of that and how did he die i asked interestedly he just died in his chair one evening in the room which he used as a library it was his custom to sit there every night when there were no visitors reading until twelve o'clock or later he was a bachelor, and his household consisted of a cook, a housemaid, and a man who had been with him for thirty years, I believe. At the time of Mr. Madison's death, his household had recently been deprived of two of its members. The cook and housemaid both resigned one morning, giving as their reason the fact that the place was haunted. In what way? I interviewed the precious pair at the time, and they told me absurd and various tales about dark figures wandering around the corridors and bending over them in bed at night whispering when their chief trouble was a continuous ringing of bells about the house bells they said that it became unbearable night and day there were bells ringing all over the house at any rate they went and for three or four days the gables was occupied only by mr madison and his man whose name was stevens i interviewed the latter also and he was an altogether more reliable witness a decent steady sort of man whose story impressed me very much at the time did he confirm the ringing he swore to it a sort of jangle sometimes up in the air near the ceilings and sometimes under the floor like the shaking of silver bells nayland smith stood up abruptly and began to pace the room leaving great trails of blue-gray smoke behind him your story is sufficiently interesting inspector he declared even to divert my mind from the eternal contemplation of the fu manchu problem this would appear to be distinctly a case of an astral bell such as we sometimes hear of in india it was stevens continued weymouth who found mr madison he stevens had been out on business connected with the household arrangements and at about eleven o'clock he returned letting himself in with a key and there was a light in the library and getting no response to his knocking stevens entered he found his master sitting bolt upright in a chair clutching the arms with rigid fingers and staring straight before him with a look of such frightful horror on his face that stevens positively ran from the room and out of the house mr madison was stone dead when a doctor who lives at no great distance away came and examined him he could find no trace of violence whatever he had apparently died of fright to judge from the expression on his face anything else only this i learnt indirectly that the last member of the quaker family to occupy the house had apparently witnessed the apparition which had led to his vacating the place i got the story from the wife of a man who had been employed as a gardener there at the time the apparition, which he witnessed in the hallway, if I remember rightly, took the form of a sort of luminous hand clutching a long curved knife. "'Oh, heavens!' cried Smith, and laughed shortly. "'That's quite in order. And this gentleman told no one of the occurrence until after he had left the house, no doubt in order that the place should not acquire an evil reputation. 
Most of the original furniture remained, and Mr. Madison took the house furnished. I don't think there can be any doubt that what killed him was fear at seeing a repetition. Of the fiery hand, concluded Smith. Quite so. Well, I examined the gables pretty closely, and with another Scotland Yard mad spent a night in the empty house. We saw nothing, but once, very faintly, we heard the ringing of bells. Smith spun around upon him rapidly. You can swear to that, he snapped. I can swear to it, declared Weymouth stolidly. It seemed to be over our heads. We were sitting in the dining room. Then it was gone, and we heard nothing more whatever of an unusual nature. Following the death of Mr. Madison, the gables remained empty until a while ago, when a French gentleman named Leger leased it. Furnished? Yes, nothing was removed. Who kept the place in order? A married couple living in the neighborhood undertook to do so. The man attended to the lawn and so forth, and the woman came once a week, I believe, to clean up the house. And Leger? He came in only last week, having leased the house for six months. His family were to have joined him in a day or two, and he, with the aid of the pair I have just mentioned, and assisted by a French servant he brought over with him, was putting the place in order. At about twelve o'clock on Friday night, this servant ran into a neighboring house screaming, The fiery hand! And when at last a constable arrived, and a frightened group went up to the avenue to the gables, they found Monsieur Leger dead in the avenue, near the steps just outside the hall door. He had the same face of horror. "'What a tale for the press!' snapped Smith. "'The owner has managed to keep it quiet so far, but this time I think it will leak into the press, yes.' There was a short silence, then. "'Have you been down to the Gables again?' "'I was there on Saturday, but there's not a scrap of evidence. The man undoubtedly died of fright in the same way as Madison. The place ought to be pulled down. It's unholy.' "'Unholy is the word,' I said. "'I never heard anything like it. "'This Monsieur Leger had no enemies. "'There could be no possible motive.' "'None whatever. "'He was a businessman from Marseilles, "'and his affairs necessitated his remaining in or near London "'for some considerable time. "'Therefore he decided to make his headquarters here temporarily "'and lease the gables without intention.' "'Nayland Smith was pacing the floor with increasing rapidity. "'He was tugging at the lobe of his left ear.' and his pipe had long since gone out. End of chapter 24 Recording by Elaine Tweddle, Stirling, Ontario